Welcome back. Thanks for staying with us on News at Prime. Now, the exportation of some of South Africa's citrus fruit to Europe could be under threat. That's if a vote on the new cold treatment regulations is passed. The European Union Standing Committee on Plant, Animal, Food and Feed will discuss the false codling moth, which feeds on many species of crops, including citrus fruit this week. For more on this, we are joined by Dion Hubert, who is part of a special citrus growers association envoy for market access and EU matters. A very good evening to you. Thank you so much for your, uh, for your time. Under threat is not what we want to hear when we, you know, facing a very tough time in South Africa, the economy is not doing so well, and of course, uh, the threat of COVID-19. Talk to us about what this all means. Good evening, Paul. Thank you very much for your time and allowing us the program. We'd love to like to be here. It's nice to speak to you. So, the background to it is that South Africa's citrus has been going to Europe for probably near 200 years, and we've had unhindered access, and it's going really well. The citrus industry is growing the rapid pace, we're, uh, we're enjoying you know, the, the income from between when I started in 2014, joined them on market access to last year, went up from 7, 8 billion to 25 billion. So it's a nice story to tell. If you take a look, look at, the, at the jobs in, in, this, in the industry, it probably you know, we went up from up to about 140,000 people working in the industry now. So, and for every 10 million carts we grow, and the growth, rap, as you rightly said, is rapid now, uh, we put about 10,000 jobs on the, on, the, on the table. So it's, um, it's a great industry to be in. It's got all the nice things that you just spoke about that combats, you know, uh, COVID. So it's got vitamin C and citrus. It's synonymous. And the, and the demand or the... Uh, the, the amount of customers that demand citrus in Europe has grown tremendously. We've, we've probably more than five grown our volume to Europe over the last seven years by more than 50%. So everywhere is a success story. So in comes this um, potential ban, uh, which uh, surfaced somewhere in, in November and found its way into an SPS notification and a WTO without prior consultation, which uh, principally says that South Africa needs to go to a process called cold steady, which implies uh, quite a significant change from the current market access or the requirements for market access. And, uh, and that really threatens a, a major uh, proportion of our citrus going to Europe. And I think if I'm correct, we need about around about 40, 45% of our citrus goes to Europe annually. So it's a big part of our our success story, and of course, we we trying our best to avert that uh, the danger. And in trying your best, uh, what what is your strategy in in perhaps uh, averting this? Yeah, look, uh, the first thing I think that's that's fair to say is that all countries are allowed to look after their plant health, and and if there is really a threat, then principally you would uh, you would uh, you would put in measures to protect yourself. So um, the argument we have here is that South Africa has been doing this for over 100 years. We've got a very stringent export protocol with regard to various uh, pests, which, we, had, which we, we do. And if the EU or the European Commission would find that South Africa is, you know, is, is grow, growing in, in sort of interceptions or we'll call it uh, interceptions of pests on their border, then they can come back to us and say, look, we've got a problem. We need to address this. But that's not the case. The interceptions on false calling, well, to give you an idea, we do about 800,000 tons to Europe annually. <clears throat> that's about anything between 38 or 40,000 of these 40-foot cooler or uh, refrigerated containers. Um, that's about 40,000 consignments, separate, separate documents. Uh, we've had 15 interceptions last year, which implies something like 99.99% um, adherence, so which we've done good. So the, if you, it, it fails into in, insignificance. And um, so the statistics that they are currently using or that they're trying to base, put this case on or base this case on is really doesn't, doesn't give them that, that kind of leverage or that kind of, um, of uh, for it, um, ability to make a case. And we're just trying to point out that's not, it's not that there's other countries with also plant and plant products to Europe, which have much bigger interceptions than in 40 and 140, and we're not yet to throw them under the bus. 
The point is, if the EU wants to wants to make false calling mod a serious issue, there's other examples that have much bigger problems. If you argue that, you, uh, I would say we are the least of the defaulters. So we're the, the small guy in the behind in behind in the queue, and um, there's other places where they can they can they can focus first before they get to us. But the fact is, uh, it went to a legislative case. It was filed at the WTO. We tried our best now to to talk to various role players and stakeholders in Europe, especially the people that are, have this vote if this thing is going through. They call it SCOPAV or the, uh, the rightly, as you said, the, the committee or the standing committee on plant health, plant, and they have a vote. That we, we, do, we saw about 11 of the 27 over the past three weeks to bring our case. And the good news is where we are today, tonight is that they have Monday and Tuesday, they've withdrawn that, uh, that legislation to rework it and consult, which is that really good news for us. Yeah, that that does sound like uh, good news. But uh, is it uh, permanent uh, good news in terms of the long-term decision that could essentially come into effect? And um, if so, we already know that 2021 was a challenging year for citrus growers who at uh, a point halted harvesting citrus to help ease congestion at, uh, at the various ports. Yeah, you, you're absolutely correct. I think, look, the first one is, you know, the, the, the industry has so, so much enormous positive. You, we just talked about labor. We talked about the foreign earnings around 25, 26 billion a year. Um, growing rapidly, uh, new jobs on the market. The Citrus Grow Association puts bursaries, about 60 uh, bursaries for our, our young kids, especially those from disadvantaged backgrounds, on, um, you know, up every year. And we retain about 85% of them in the industry. So there's, there's so much to go for it. And, you know, rightly, it's a fruit, so it's healthy. It's got vitamin C. It's, it's good for you. It's Organic. Everybody is tries. You know, everybody's buying lemons these days. It isn't in a, a drink. It's you know, Jamie Oliver who's cooking and and you know and and uh, uh, taking using the rind for cooking. So everybody's becoming Jamie Oliver these days. So there's a lot of nice things happening. But you have to say, you know, it's market access is a difficult thing. You know, it's not. But everybody in the world is looking at opportunities to to uh, to look after their own. Um, their own industries, and that's fair. But I mean, you must have reasonable, um, a reasonable cause to decide that you're going to restrict, you know, a trade which is more than 100 years old, and and that is our case. So so we are very vigilant, and, and we will definitely uh, work with them as best we can. We try to be constructive here, <clears throat> but also you know clearly indicate that that what currently was on the table is not acceptable because it's. It's, it's got no scientific or statistical base. And, um, and we will, you know, we will show them. And we have, I think, over the last years, as I said to you, the interceptions have been exceedingly low. And for a massive country, a massive export program, to have such a low, you know, how heat rate. So, you know, if you can, you can calculate the other way around, you can say, you know, we are 99.99% successful. And we were we 0.001% unsuccessful. So it's such a small margin and such a small number. And um, if the EU comes to us and so look, what can we do to, to additionally uh, improve the situation? I mean, constructively, we look at great. We, we know this is a long-term game. We want to be in there. We think it's great for our rural communities. We have, a, as I said, you have a huge amount of we need jobs in rural areas uh, for everyone. Uh, South Africa is a... Uh, is struggling currently with jobs and growth and, and funding and stuff. And, and these, yeah. these farms at the moment are growing at such a wonderful rate. And all and look, it's, it's heavily uh, dependent on, on manual labor. So it's wonderful in, in rural areas. So it, it gives us a great opportunity. We must really look after this. So what would the ripple effect be should um, this process not go your way? Should they come back with a different answer? I yeah. mean, looking at the ripple effect in terms of jobs, in terms of export, in terms of the price of citrus, perhaps also in Europe. Mm. Look, I mean, you, uh, it's very difficult to give you a number, but I, if you if you calculate roughly that we've got, you know, this 26 to probably in soon uh, 38, 28 or 30 billion rand of foreign earnings uh, out of the citrus industry and 45% of that goes to 
to the EU and, you know, you talk about 140 people, but if you want to do another, another calculation, you can argue that in the rural areas, you know, for every guy who's got a job, there's 10 people depending on them. So 1.4, 1.5 million people are depending on the industry for their livelihood. Then it's, it's, it, the impact would be, you know, disastrous. It would have a massive impact on, on farmers, but it would have a much bigger impact on, on, on rural areas where, where a huge amount of the population is, is dependent on, on citrus. And, and I, you know, so this is just, I think that the argument for us is this. <clears throat> because we, we believe the statistics and the case for a crisis or for a problem with the South Africa is so weak, uh, we are saying this is a clear indication that if this dossier that the EU is preparing would work, you don't need much to, to, to keep people out of your market in a, in a, in a call it non-constructive way. And it's, it's impeding on free trade and stuff like that. So we, we have the Department of Agriculture, uh, Dalbrad support, and they are, they are working side by side with us. So, you know, our, our thanks and our, and our, uh, appreciation for them. And we've got a great team all over, you know, the, the, the Perishable Products Export Control Board. They do all our inspections. They are a great asset. They, they're the exporters. FPF are a, um, a stakeholder in, in the sense that they all employ a lot of the uh, agent people that export. So, all in all, I mean, there's a lot. There's a great team working. But you, as you rightly say, we've got a few challenges. First, one, the international commodity crisis with the um, subsequent effect on on shipping and availability of of space, ships, and, and containers, another one. So we, we've got quite a few. I mean, I mean we haven't been in, in, in Africa and in South Africa, all of us, for, for three, four hundred years without uh, getting some related resilience. And uh, I'm sure we're going we're gonna to work this thing through. Absolutely. All the best, uh, of course. Uh, and thank you for your time, Dion Huber, who is part of a, the special um, Citrus Growers Association envoy for the market access and EU matters. Speaking to some of the challenges when it comes to exportation, speaking to um, a threat that could hopefully be averted with some time frames now being given. Let's